Well, as I mentioned, my name is Mario Lugai, and I serve as Justice Funders Senior Innovation Director. Um, and today I have the privilege of not only introducing um, Susan True of the Santa Cruz Community Foundation and Laura Seaman of the League of California Community Foundations, but to also bring to all of you here a bit of what it felt like to experience the cohort. Our co cohort included four one hour and a half sessions, and we started each of these four sessions we had together in the same exact way. We did this because what if in a time of innovation and exceptionalism, um, what if it's all the, if the change that we need lies not in what's new, um, but what we do in practice and rep repetition, whether in the ways we check in on our friends, both when they're doing well and when they're struggling, in the ways we may kiss our kids goodbye when they leave the house or goodnight before we close their doors, or in the ways that we pause and listen and share vulnerability and attention with one another. We began each of our sessions exercising our collective action and community muscles. And we'll start today with, with all of you with that same exercise. I invite all of you to get into a comfortable position if you're not already in one, letting go, go of anything in your hands, of anything distracting you. Um, if you'd like, I invite you to close your eyes and relax in your breath. Now I invite you to remember back to a younger version of yourself, specifically one without the values or politics that you might have today, a version of yourself much earlier in your civic journey. It might even be a version of yourself that would be a little embarrassed to have sharing their political point of view today. Now I want you to remember some of the people who came into your life and helped shape you and move you from that younger self um, to who you are today. They could be partners or professors, um, perhaps a classmate or colleague, friends or family members, organizers, or even elected officials. Now think specifically of one of those people who played a particularly significant role in your civic journey. Now, if you happen to have a pen or a piece of paper or post it, um, we invite you to write down, thank you, the name of the person you just thought of, uh, and then period. Normally, if we were together in a room sharing space, this would be the moment where we go into breakout rooms and where we would allow each of you to introduce yourselves to the space, to one another, um, leading with gratitude by going around and saying thank you, the person's name you just wrote down, and why you're thanking them as if they were in the room with us today. In lieu of this, and given the size of this group, I'll invite Laura and Susan to this, to this exercise uh, and to share their gratitude with us for their folks. Um, so Laura, can I start with you? Thank you, Robin. Thank you, David. Uh, awesome. <laughs> Thank you both. I was gonna invite you to share uh, maybe a sentence on why you're thanking each of them as well. Uh, but we could, oh yeah, Laura, do you wanna go? Go ahead, go ahead Susan. <laughs> um, I thank David, he is uh, my late husband. He died 11 years ago yesterday and we were, our mm. relationship came together through our activism. And so today mm. feels like an important day to, to recognize his role in my life. I want to thank Robin for showing me what it looks like to be uh, a lifelong friend. Thank you both. Um, we do this exercise for a few reasons when introducing people uh, to our work. Um, first, one of the greatest dangers in this type of work, whether it's uh, civic engagement or social justice, is falling towards self-righteousness to ever act as if we were born with the politics and values we have today to use um, our kind of learning is as a weapon rather than an invitation to people still early in their civic journeys. This exercise reminds us that we weren't born with the politics or the values that we have today by reminding us of a time before we had them, and that if we ever did act in that way, we would in some ways be making the person we just thanked invisible. A second reason I like to do this exercise is because one of the things that has most captivated me about community organizing work, social justice work, civic engagement work, is its concern for legacy as much as impact. Impact might be the laws you get passed, the resources you mobilize, the campaign you win, but your legacy as an organizer is about whether or not in an exercise like this, 
20 years from now, 10 years from now, someone will be thanking you for your impact on them. Our legacy in this work is tied to the personal transformation we allow others to have and the ways we allow this to tra transform us as well. Finally, we brought this exercise to this group because community foundations in this age of choice and hyper-connectivity are so very uniquely positioned to be the institutions and individuals we'll be thanking in 10 to 20 years for advancing people's individual and communal civic journeys. Um, with that, and in the spirit of mutuality with Laura and Susan, we would love to invite all of you to write in the chat, thank you and the name of the person uh, you thought of in this activity. Certainly, if we're thankful for you being here, we're thankful for them um, and their impact and their effect in getting bringing you here today. And with that, I'm so pleased to be able to turn it over to Laura Seaman, CEO of the League um, of California Community Foundations. Um, and we kind of invited her to share why the League chose to invest and experiment with this cohort what need or desire uh, were you responding to, Laura? And of all the times, why now? Thank you so much, Mario. And thanks to everyone for spending this time with us. Um, a year ago, let's say a little more than a year ago when you and I were dreaming up this session, Mario, for, uh, well, this cohort, and then more recently, this, this session with the council. Uh, you asked me, I think you said, why did you want to launch a pilot cohort program on community foundations and civic homes uh, in the middle of a pandemic as a brand new CEO while the world was figuratively in, in California, uh, kind of literally on fire? Um, and the most honest answer I have is that I really didn't want to. Uh, I, I think I was three months into this job when we first connected about this idea. The pandemic had just hit and my cute little work plan and budget for the year had already been sort of torn up and, and thrown into the wind. Uh, frankly, the last thing I wanted to do was dig around for the time and resources and buy-in to do something like this without knowing how it would go, uh, if I'm being really honest, without really understanding what a civic home framework meant for community foundations and really just not knowing if anything would come out of this uh, investment of our time and energy, which had so many other demands on them really from all angles at that time. The reason we did it anyway is because we needed to. I'll, I'll speak for myself. I needed a space with other people who were worried about the same things I was, uh, the shrinking space for civil society, uh, particularly in our digital age, trends in declining civic engagement, rising polarization and politicization of social issues, certainly growing, growing power imbalances and wealth inequality and just the com increasingly complex and interconnected threats to the health and wealth of our communities. COVID laid these bare in such dark ways. I think that's the push I really needed to feel like convening a cohort uh, like this one was a role that made sense for the league to play as a statewide coalition. Um, but I definitely didn't need to be in a space where we all just collectively worried about these things. I had that part all covered on my own. What I needed and I think what we all needed was to be in a space together where we could step out of crisis mode uh, and all this immediate anxiety for a minute and try answering questions like the ones that you posed to us, Mario, during our time together. So crises aside, what makes a community a good home? What do you need in order to feel loved by the place that you live? What do you need to be able to love your community? And how do you show that love to your community uh, and really at the highest level, what impact do we want to have in our communities, in our day-to-day -day work? What legacy do we want to leave when we're gone? And are those the same thing? So whatever you want to call this space that we share, the independent sector, third sector, civil society, there's something about it that I think has drawn each of us into this room, to this conference, uh, into the work that we've all felt called to do with uh, with at least our work lives. Um, for me, there was an opportunity here to lean into that and explore place-based, community-based collective action uh, statewide and to understand how could the community foundation model is and can be a better tool for, uh, for us to envision and build better futures for our communities through civic engagement. Uh, I think the big question that really um, 
made this possible was don't we all know there's there's something bigger that we can be together isn't that why we're all here right now uh, and we wanted to create a space to explore that that's wonderful thank you laura um and next up i'm honored to introduce susan um of course, we couldn't have a cohort of California Community Foundation CEOs without California Community Foundation CEOs. Um, and Susan, I'm so glad you said yes and that you invited two of your um, team members to join us. I remember uh, just being so curious of who this person was who both had the ability to attract and as well as the openness and sense of abundance to hire who you did, specifically the former mayor of your community and a former museum director, not the typical kind of hires for community foundations. Um, given the unprecedented, unprecedented demand put upon community foundations during this pandemic, we invite you to share why you decided to join. Thanks, Mario. Um, I think like Laura, we were looking for a space where we could reflect on everything that was happening so fast and all the demands on us and think about what was being asked of us for the future in a new way. And to get to do that with the incredible facilitation and perspective that Mario brings and with other foundation leaders and with our league to try to grow some of this learning, it felt like a really important opportunity. Um, I think I joined the community foundation world um, just three and a half years ago. So I'm, I'm not yet a lifer, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, one of my observations coming in is that we could be so much more than we are, that community foundations so often speak about growth in terms of our asset size or other metrics, but that my belief in everything I've done in my life has been that people grow and movements develop through relationships. And that if we could think about deepening our relationships, if we could think about the people who really need the community foundation to take that next step in their civic journey, that we can be closely, deeply connected around some of the things that feel so intractable in our community, um, that bringing people together about what we care about bridges a growingly segregated community. But Santa Cruz County, for many of you, you may think of as a little beach town with a college in it. That's true, but we're also a county um, with incredible agricultural and uh, property wealth. We border Silicon Valley, and um, we have just become so segregated with people not even understanding why we have a food bank on the one hand and other people not able to eat without it. And it just felt like this idea about how do we help people move through their own civic journey with the Community Foundation as a center place for that just felt right for me and like kind of what I bring to the work around relationships. Um, and then just the thought, like one of the things that um, Mario has said with us a lot is that, you know, we join things to bring out the best in us, right? We, have, we, we hopefully choose life partners because they bring out the best in us. We hopefully contribute to other people's lives because we help bring out the best in them. And a cohort really helps us to do that with each other. And that's what I wanna do with the people who, you know, the idea of the Community Foundation as a civic home is about that at a, at a closer to home level, that we help to bring out the best in each other so we can all serve and make that kind of legacy level of commitment to, to the communities that we care about. Thank you, that's beautiful. Um, so what I'd like to do now is share a little bit about the Civic Home Framework um, or a Civic Home Framework. Uh, there is no single version, um, but I thought I'd start by first just telling you a little bit about my first civic home um, to understand how we're thinking about civic homes. Um, my first civic home was a group in the Northwest Bronx called CAV Organizing Asian Communities. Um, it was a grassroots um, organization whose mission statement read, CAV works to build grassroots community power across the diverse poor and working class Asian immigrant and refugee communities in New York City. Um, that's our mission statement, but what was interesting was when the Iraq war hit, when Hurricane Katrina happened, our offices were full of people the next day. That doesn't make sense necessarily if you read our mission statement, but it made sense if you like um, others in New York understood that CAV was a civic and political home for Asian American 
organizers, wannabe organizers, um, so much so that when, when big things happen in the world, our instinct was to come together at CAV to understand what that event meant in the larger context of things um, and how we could individually and collectively respond to it. A civic home kind of does that, right? It, it helps us to collectively understand and, and make meaning of, of the world around us. And at the same time, it's also paying attention to who we are uh, as we come each time, who we're growing into, who we're becoming, um, and the ways in which we're transforming each other and hopefully our communities around us. There may be many different definitions of civic homes, um, but here's one that we developed for the cohort that I'll share. Civic homes are places of new possibility simultaneously for the individuals, the communities they are part of, and societies at large. A civic home's core function is to catalyze, support, nurture, and nourish, and sometimes guide as needed people's civic journeys. Subsequently, civic journeys are the progression over time of a person's understanding and use of their agency to actively intervene in the shape and direction of the world around them. A person's civic journey is typically marked and accelerated by moments of personal transformation, most often occurring in the presence and because of being with others. Uh, what's important to note in this framing um, is that Civic homes, uh, like homes when they work really well, are both congratulating us for who we are today, but also preparing us, urging us, nudging us um, for what's to come and for the type of person that we might not even see ourselves growing into um, in the way that a parent prepares their kids. Again, not for who they are, um, but who they see their kids becoming. In terms of a civic home framework, frameworks are basic conceptual structures from which to build upon. I mean, in this way, a civic home framework is just a conceptual structure from which community foundations can build upon together and with the, that level of intention and experimentation that existing in a hyper-changing world requires. Um, arguably, it's not only not prescriptive, but in many ways, um, an invitation to be more expansive for all stakeholders, uh, for foundation staff, for community members and communities themselves, as Laura and Susan so beautifully touched upon, um, it begs questions that tend to be more expansive than the ones that come out of um, a lot of how community foundations are trained, um, whether uh, in terms of donor services or business development, and centers questions such as what do I need to feel loved by my community and what do I need to love and be able to express that love for my community. Um, it also begs to be explored with others. At its core, a civic home framework is relational and more transformative than transactional. And thus it's not something that we ever thought we could just kind of develop and give over, but that required um, a cohort model um, whose strength lies in the practice of uh, collective action uh, and the transformative. Um, and with that, I'll share one last thing before turning it back over. Um, in much the same way we talk about civic journeys, the cohort was itself um, a journey that we saw ourselves on um, with all of the members of it. Um, and so we traveled together. Um, with our first session um, being around building our we, who are these people that we will be kind of uh, traversing this exploration with, um, grounding ourselves in why we were coming together and why now, uh, discussing the threats, but also opportunities um, and the concepts of civic journey, civic identities and civic homes. Um, then exploring ourselves, um, for ourselves, the notion of home um, and the foundations from which we want to build those homes upon, that framework, the studs um, that, that will ground us, um, including hearing a little bit about uh, the East Bay Community Foundations, 
uh, donor leadership cohort. So happy to have May um, here from that. Um, our third session leaned into our civic imaginations and freedom dreams, and we had fun with the question of, or the exercise, yes, and uh, building upon our ideas of what is included in civic homes, talking about the type of love that we find in civic homes, uh, and then closing with um, what we will go into now, um, which is this notion of both impact and legacy. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Laura. Well, I'd also love to uh, not to punt here, but to hear from Susan too about some of the uh, the questions that this cohort experience had um, had left her with. But let me had left her team with. But let me first come back to this idea uh, that may tie in about the the difference between impact and legacy and some of the the ways that we've come to think about that in the context of community foundations as civic homes. Uh, Mario, you shared a video with us in preparation for one of our sessions. Uh, where, a part where someone in the video was sort of speaking backwards in time uh, to, to, you know, the next year, forwards in time, I guess, to the next generation and saying, we loved you in advance. Uh, and that really stuck with me as a, uh, an illustration of, of what we are thinking about when we talk about legacy. Um, I also want to bring in another voice from the cohort who wasn't able to join us. Um, but Vanessa Bechtel from the Ventura County Community Foundation shared uh, some, some reflections with us uh, before this session today on this question of impact versus legacy as a community foundation. She shared that during the COVID crisis, one of the things that her community foundation was able to do that was a new area of community engagement for their team was awarding over $20 million in grants and counting to small business owners. Uh, so not just charitable grants, but small business support. Uh, and then in the process of doing over 4,000 grants in a really short period of time, they needed to uh, make the application widely available. They had to translate the text and all the responses across 16 different languages. Their community is 850,000 people across 10 cities. Um, and for many of these business grants, this was the, the applicant's first time interacting with the community foundation. So they're looking at all of this quote unquote impact that they're making and, and truly what an impact it was. Uh, but she says, I had to ask myself, are we a place that everyone feels they can access and connect with on a personal level? How can we be better at welcoming them? How are we unwelcoming them that we need to change? She says, these questions are already changing the practical, tactical ways that we show up in our community and is starting to reshape how we're living our spirit and our values of relationship, partnership, and trust. Community foundations have an incredible role to play as civic homes and hubs of civic engagement, if we can answer some of these questions together. And with that, I wanna turn it to, to Susan to hear a little bit about what they have uh, taken from this cohort and are leaving uh, with or from the cohort. Yeah, I think one of the things that we were able to think about a lot as our team of the former museum director, former mayor and community foundation CEO <laughs> walked into this cohort. And we thought a lot about you know, who has the community foundation already been a civic home for? And what has that meant for them? And who's been left out of that? And what has that meant for those people? And I, that's been a very central question to us. And um, it comes at the same time where like many community foundations, um, we've brought together leaders of color around racial equity work and that group, which we call Rise Together, along with this about five to 10% of our donors who we feel like if we really invest in, they can become so much more than donors. But that group with this group of really incredible leaders of color in our community can actually connect to work towards shared goals and shared solutions, shared values, shared amplified voice in a way that's really new for us. So. The cohort helped us to think about different streams of work and how instead of thinking about it as streams of work, we think about it as a way to welcome people home who maybe haven't felt at home at the foundation before and for whom maybe they did, but what would it be like if we were more than just a place for their uh, financial gifts, but a place truly for their civic journey. So that's been really helpful for us. It still feels um, you know, quite, quite new. And at the same time, we've been thinking so much about 
how we so clearly already are a home. Like many of you, I'm sure your community asked much of you during the pandemic. And it's really allowed us to think about what does that mean? What if, you know, we did 70% of our, our gifts um, around the pandemic were given to organizations led by and for people of color? And how does that change things for how we position ourselves as a home? So we're asking a lot of those kinds of questions with this new idea about a home as a place where you get to come back to, where you get to be nurtured and thrive, as Mario said, for who you are and for who we all need to be next for our communities to be truly equitable. So that's, I don't know if that's helpful, Laura, but that's how we're, we're thinking about it. And it's, so it's much more specific. I think when we first entered the cohort, we thought about a civic home and, for everyone. And it starts to feel a little nebulous then and actually kind of lose its power. So we started to really think about which people, you know, which 10% of donors are we actually talking about? Which, you know, 20%, of some of our most impactful leaders. What if we brought them together? Like, what if we invested in those people in our community? And that's starting to feel like a much more powerful way to think about this. And then you gotta know, like in any social movement, other people come next, right? But who are those people if we over-invest in, we can really help to change things. Yeah, uh, and that uh, let me let me just add, Mario, as a community organizer, you know this better than anyone. Collective action around anything is hard, especially a kind of fuzzy idea and topic like this. It's particularly hard, I think, within civil society where things are by nature diverse and complex and, and often uh, increasingly maybe divisive. And at the same time, as community foundations, we're in this unique position, but also as, as Susan has mentioned in this unique moment to harness some of the trust that's been placed in us by our communities and really invest in those that want to deepen their political civic engagement and they need a civic home uh, to be able to do that um, and, and to, to really be over invested in at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, Susan, it was, it was fascinating that that was one of the things I was most lifted up, this notion of um, that a civic home framework doesn't mean a change in relationship with everyone in your community. Um, it, it's in part driven by a fear, um, a fear of, are there any ways in which people wanna bring their full selves to this beautiful work, whether you call it social movements or civic engagement, that wear a ceiling for their participation uh, rather than a springboard or a trampoline or a floor. And what the civic home framework is meant to do is just to open that up. Um, and in fact, I, I think for the for a majority of your uh, kind of members, donors, stakeholders, your relationship will stay the same. But for the 10, 20% of individuals who were always looking for more, but might not have had the same privileges as we've had to encounter the people who've pushed us and pulled us to be um, more than we thought we could, um, that this would expand um, that possibility for them. Um, and the other thing I, I just wanted to say in terms of impact versus legacy, um, part of the reason I was so grateful to Laura for considering this as something to do together is because um, community foundations have a lot of kind of increasing threats um, that they're facing, whether from financial institutions, um, even some from progressive DAF reform sometimes. Um, but my hope is uh, that a framework adopted by a critical mass of community foundations might begin to shift the conversation culturally, where in fact individuals begin to assume that as members of a community, they should have a civic home and that civic home should be where they live. And that one day um, with enough kind of normalizing of this thought, um, community foundations will find themselves doing less kind of advertising or outreach, but instead find people coming to them um, because they seek that civic home that they heard uh, their you know, cousins in Santa Cruz had when they moved there. Um, because when they moved to Santa Cruz, they received a welcome to Santa Cruz's civic life uh, packet and mailer. I literally just moved and I just got a packet from uh, USPS and 
they were basically coupons for home security and pizza. Uh, and I was like, oh, what if the community foundation sent this where they were coupons to free organizing training or um, a, a free visit to a local community-based organization. Um, so yeah, so that's in terms of impact and legacy, something I wanted to share. Uh, it looks like we have some time. Jen, am I right that we're going until 1040? Uh, Laura and Susan, what do you think about kind of opening this conversation up to questions, comments, feedback, reactions? I'd, I'd really love to. I'd, I'd also add a, a light prompt, let's say that I'd love to hear from those folks from the community foundation world that are uh, with us today. How do you think about your community foundation's role? Are you already a civic home? In what ways? To whom? Um, and, and how do you aspire to, to be more? Mario, the session should come with a coupon for a free coffee to get everyone perked up. Yeah. So, um, I, I'd like to say a, a thing or two. Hi, this is Dana uh, from Louisville, Kentucky. And I'm not sure that I'm actually answering your question, but I do wanna say how much I have really appreciated um, this particular session in a previous life. Uh, I was the executive director for a local organizing group called the Network Center for Community Change in Louisville that organized like 5,000 folks to make change in some of Louisville's most underinvested neighborhoods. And um, the thing that really strikes me from this conversation is that that work was really the answer to a question that our community had not yet asked, and yet it remains an important question during these times. And I'm just so delighted to uh, learn what community foundations in you all's area have been doing and uh, excited to take the information back to our community foundations leadership to figure out like, okay, what is it that we're currently doing that we could leverage and get a little bit closer uh, to the ground? That's wonderful, Dana. And I just wanna say again, um, I feel like you all probably have a lot of these answers um, of, of kind of the community foundations that I know of. Louisville keeps coming up, um, often with the framework of asking questions, but certainly, um, in asking questions, you all are also developing knowledge. And then also the questions are also <laughs> the best questions. Uh, I think a lot of us um, don't have answers to yet. And so are eagerly awaiting uh, to, to find out what some of the answers you find are uh, and would be more than willing to kind of uh, listen and learn from, from how you all have been engaging everyone. Can I add in uh, on Dana's comments there? Yeah, hi, Tara. Of course. Hi, I'm Tara Sandercock with the Community Foundation of Greater Greensboro in North Carolina. And um, I too really appreciate this framework. Um, I, I think it, you know, it could be something that we can use to organize uh, conversations that we are feeling the need to have more of. Uh, we have a long tradition of um, supporting uh, our Building Stronger Neighborhoods Network and grant making. We have done social capital. We have done many, many community initiatives around parts of what you are pulling together in this kind of framework. And we're currently um, doing a feasibility study, if you will, on establishing a center for civic engagement. And uh, I see a lot of uh, synergy with uh, the kinds of conversations you're having, but I think it's really important to not just do the feasibility of would this, how would this fit with the community, but also there's a certain component we need to be doing ourselves internally to 
continue to refine our vision for our, our role. And of course that's informed by the community. And uh, so I just wanna add my um, uh, appreciation to how Dana expressed as well that, that I think this is very useful. I'd, I'd like to, to read more about it and see, see more uh, of the, I loved your map there, your, your journey map, and uh, we'd love to see it, uh, you know, to really kind of immerse myself in it and think about the application for us um, and, and share notes on that. I think that it's, um, you know, each community foundation is so different and yet we have so many things that are the same in terms of opportunity. And uh, I'd love to see us continue the conversation. So I'll stop talking except to say thank you. Well, and Tara, the, the sameness and the difference are both really key ingredients to this I, in, the, in the way that I'm thinking about how we'll carry this forward into the next phase, uh, which full disclosure, uh, this is our first uh, sort of public conversation about this. We wrapped up last month and we're debriefing and um, and reflecting and, and that'll continue, but we're uh, it, it has lit a spark in more ways than one, at least out here in California, um, where I think it couldn't be more timely. And I think we have a really, uh, really important uh, and, and maybe sort of limited opportunity to harness some of this momentum, at least in our state, which is uh, a complicated place um, in many ways. But uh, we, you know, we're also at, as a, a league of California Community Foundations plugged in with obviously the council, the forum, the independent sector, uh, other community foundations across the country. And I just, I feel like there's so much power and potential in those kinds of networks. We've just started statewide because that's how we, uh, how we think about our, our community. Mm -hmm. um, Mario, if you would share. Laura, can I just say thank you? Can I say that I, uh, I don't know if anyone from the council is on here, <laughs> but I miss we our do. foundations conferences. I miss them. <laughs> I miss the gathering of the tribe, uh, at tribes, plural. And I'm really hoping that when we can get back in person, we can have those forums where, where we can, you know, on a more frequent basis, have these types of, of, uh, of um, sharing. So anyway, sorry, Laura, thank you for your comment. No, th thanks, Tara. And if anyone will be at the Kansas conference in October, um, I'll see you there, hopefully in person, uh, knock on wood. Um, in the meantime, though, I'd love if Mario could share the, the final screen with our contact information too, because I wouldn't want you to leave without having that if you do want to be in touch, even just to compare notes or brainstorm, um, and certainly to, to get engaged in whatever the next phase looks like for us. So you'll see the league's information there. That's my personal email address. Um, and then justice funders as well, who have just been catalytic in this and really, uh, really wonderful partners. And Tara and Dana, that, that actually sounds, uh, again, we haven't talked about next steps, but um, imagining at the very least you two and maybe both of your foundations participating in your own cohort uh, in the South feels like that could be a powerful thing as well. Um, I wanted to raise a question by Gwyneth and Susan, I was wondering if you, you might be able to um, answer it which is um, a question about how should private foundations um, interact, engage, invest in community foundations? We have a number of private foundations that are our close partners. And you know, in some ways I feel they've selected us as, as their partner to build civic homes. You know, they know that they don't have the same on the ground knowledge. Our staff, you know, one of the things that I've done since I've been at our foundation the last three and a half years is say, how do we get our staff freed from any paperwork, anything that takes us out of relationship with our community um, and, and replace that with time in our community. And um, that has been a joyous journey. Nobody seems to miss um, letters of intent or um, <laughs> other aspects of overdone due diligence. And um, I think that, that that really close knowledge has been especially important in some of the, you know, catastrophes we've had. We've been through some terrible wildfires in 2020, um, the pandemic um, called for racial equity. You know, I think private foundations see us as a place, like if we partner with the community foundation, they'll actually know. We trust them to know who to trust. Who they trust are people that are trusted in families, trusted in veterans groups, trusted, every, and it's, it's 
I think that the best role for us as private foundations is to invite those foundations into our circle of trust and, um, and to encourage that that is the relationship we're trying to foster, um, regardless of the kind of desk you sit behind or the, um, the people that you serve. And I, I just keep thinking that, that we feel so lucky, lucky to be trusted by families in our community, by the people who serve families in our community, by funders in our community and donors, and that that's really what it takes to keep going. So um, I read it, I re saw it referred to as sidecar funding, that bigger foundations kind of jump in as the sidecar to our funding, which strikes me as not exactly what I'm trying to do, although I want to be on the road together. <laughs> but I think that that's, that's how I how I think of it as just like welcoming each other into the circle of trust that the, the more you trust, the closer to the ground that you're able to get to serve people well. One of the things I most enjoyed about the cohort, um, having been philanthropy now for some time, um, was just the celebration of very local things and feeling connected to each of the, the four communities through this cohort. Uh, Susan, your excitement over the soccer field uh, opening up and telling that story um, and then planning our potluck um, for that was wonderful. And actually one of our check-in questions was what is, what is a favorite public space from your childhood and a public space today? Um, and it was just great to, to hear. And, and yeah, I, I hope people at private foundations and institutions also get the opportunity to interact be in relationship with community foundations, uh, simply to experience um, that connectedness to, to local communities as well. Any other questions? Um, we, um, please think about them now, um, but we also just wanted to make sure to invite you as we did um, to how we open every session, we want to invite you to share um, or participate in how we close every session. Um, and for us, the two questions that were important is what are you taking with you? And what are you leaving behind? Um, and for those of us kind of very interested in, in transformative change, um, the question of, of what are you leaving behind, I found to be a really powerful one in surfacing um, ways we big or small, we, we might have been transformed either through uh, our small time together or kind of our relationship with each other um, because it, it implies that we're evolving and changing as well. Um, so in the chats or um, by unmuting yourself, we would love to hear your answers to these two questions. And as Susan said, um, uh, which was a quote in one of our sessions, we discovered during the pandemic that we already are a civic home. Um, uh, and so in some ways, the civic home framework asks that question of if we are civic homes, how can we be the best possible civic home? Um, how do we bring attention to it so that our legacy is one of full of pride for how um, not only were we a community foundation, but a civic home as well. So invite any questions, if anyone wants to unmute themselves, share anything um, as well as their people's answers to these two questions um, in the chat. And Laura and uh, Susan, in one minute, I'll give you both the opportunity to say closing remark um, if there aren't any other questions. Well, I'll say briefly, if I may, Mario, one of the many things that drew me to the community foundation world uh, as I stepped into this role was uh, the lack of competitiveness for lack of a better phrase. Uh, and I don't mean personally, I mean, we're all crazy type A uh, control freaks uh, and are very competitive uh, personally. Um, but as institutions, you know, the, the Placer Community Foundation doesn't compete with the Ventura Community Foundation. And the, 
um, the collegiality um, and collaboration and just potential for for collective action that that opens up is so powerful to me and I um, I, I would scale that up to really, you know, most of the philanthropic sector, if not all, it is how we should be thinking about these opportunities um, to work together on things like this. Uh, I'm, I'm leaving behind from this cohort uh, the mindset of scarcity that I think I was really deep into when we started this work uh, and trying to take with me more of a, a mindset of uh, abundance and collaboration. Susan? Final words? Sure, I would just say um, the idea of legacy is what I'm taking with me. I think I'm I'm a super impact focused person. Like, did we get, did we accomplish our goal? Did we do this? But the idea of legacy that we're really nurturing the people and the relationships and the place that actually make each of our foundations so special. Um, and that from a legacy point of view that in 20 years, maybe someone would thank the community foundation or me for sharing resources in an equitable way that it's no longer the foundation's resource, it's all of our communities um, to have and to hold and to deploy and to cherish. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, leaving behind um, this idea that somehow we're doing this apart from all of you. Instead, I get to do it with you and I look forward to getting to know some of you better. Um, Dana and Tara, I really appreciate your comments and, and questions, so, so thank you for that. Yeah. It's always nice to imagine that whoever we meet in life, we'll meet again. And so I think we uh, we hope we'll meet all of you again. Uh, special thanks to the full league team who's here, both Sheila and Laura. Uh, I do encourage everyone to follow the league. Uh, Laura um, is a relatively new uh, CEO and has already brought so much. And, and I know certainly Justice Funders is super excited to, to have Laura's leadership um, there. Uh, and thank you to Jen um, for helping organize us as well as to John at BAV, um, and for all of you for participating. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.